passage from the book called Living in Spring. Now reduce the sound of the music. Are we down? And today we'll talk about fraternity. So there's this text from the book called Living Spring and Tide with Fraternity. Ever since Constantine victory, which opened the doors of political hegemony to the Christian world, we have been through many experiences to show that we are disciples of Jesus. We have held renowned councils, formulating daily conclusions regarding the nature of God, the soul, the universe, and life. We have encouraged dreadful wars that impose a misery and terror on those who could not believe in the tenets of our faith. We have fought over the tongue of the Divine Master by spreading revenge fire and brandishing the murderous sword. We have created commandments and religious posts by distributing poison and whirling the dagger. We have lit fires for burnings at the stake, constructed gallows, Invented tortures and killed prisons for those who disagree with our points of view. We have encouraged interactions that caused animosity between brothers and sisters in the name of the Lord. Who on the cross for witness of his devotion to our humankind? We have built beautiful and sumptuous palaces and basilicas in his memory. Forgetting that they did not have a stone on which to harass his head. And today, we are still nourished the schism and discord, digging trenches of incomprehension and animosity against one another because we interpret the faith differently. Nevertheless, the word of Christ is, uh, the word of Christ is irrefutable. We cannot claim to be words of the good news simply by our outward attitudes. Yes, we do need education, which improves the mind, justice, which preserves the order, material progress, which enriches work and councils, which supports the study of the faith. However, without the light of love and all human activity may be lost in darkness. We will be accepted as learners of the gospel by cultivating the kingdom of God which begins in our inner life. Therefore, let us extend, let us extend pure and simple fraternity, our roundness, by mutually helping one another. The fraternity that labors and assists, understands, and forgives amidst the humility and service that ensure the victory of the good. Wherever we are, let us practice fraternity, recalling the word of the Lord, who clearly, who clearly and certainly asserted, by his own man will know that you are his disciples, if you love one another. So let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for another opportunity. Here we are together to talk about your love. We are together to learn how to improve ourselves. We are still seek your orientation. We still linger your need. Your Father, we are all very happy with this beautiful community that we are able to build. Each one of us is a singular and important part of this community. And we can learn every day with one another. That's the beautiful principle of fraternity. The same we have the opportunity to talk about today. May we learn, dear Father, about fraternity, about love each other, more and more every day. Thank you. Let me 
turn out the music. Do you want to show them how to do that? Okay. So today we are going to discuss an example of Christian fraternity. Who is my brother? Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Now, do you remember this passage from the Bible? When it says, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? <laughs> do you remember this moment? Um, more or less. <laughs> And uh, do you have any idea about why he said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Well, because when Jesus was at this place, I don't remember where, um, I think one of the disciples came to him and asked, uh, they told him that his mother and his brothers were outside and wanted to talk to him or to come inside. So that's when he would have said that. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> That's the exactly, details. <laughs> yes, that's exactly the moment. So he was preaching in a house, and the house was full. Mm -hmm. Basically, very full. There was no place for anyone to see. Mm -hmm. And then they said to him that his mother and, and his brothers were outside, going mm -hmm. to talk to him. And then he raised the question Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean and as God explained, and the gospel according to the scriptures, that he didn't like his mother, or he didn't like the brothers, he did love all of them. His mother very much as well. And this will call the bull and mm -hmm. There's a, a last chapter talking about Mary, and how much he loved her, and how much she loved him as well. So it doesn't mean that he didn't like Mary, or he didn't consider her his mother. So why does what does this mean? So let's just start with three initial questions for us to keep in mind during the start or during the week, during the month. What is fraternity? Really, like what we understand as fraternity. The question again: Who is my mother, and who are my brothers? And the last concept is: Do I apply this concept in my life? Because when we talk about these, it is always important to, to, to think about these concepts. One thing is understand, another thing is, is to feel, is to sense, is to, is to use that in your life. And the other one is apply. Many of us know how these, oh, I read these, I read that, I understand these, but I don't apply, I don't feel. So we need to work on those aspects of ourselves. So, to start this talk, I'm going to use an example from Projeto Espiritual. And here we have Jesus preaching, as he always would be preaching. And his magnetism, his love, would surround the people around him. And that's why people that lived at that period, that time, would still have wonderful memories of the preachings. So here is exactly the passage we were talking about. Uh, would you like to start reading? Sure. Um, so five, I do not know. Yes. So it's uh, so from Mark, three, twenty to twenty-one, and thirty-first to thirty-five, fifth, and then we go. Mm -hmm. So and the multitude come together again, so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. For they say, he is beside himself. There came then his brethren, brethren yes. and his ma mother. And standing without sin, standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren <laughs> without seek for three, for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? <laughs> I'm gonna learn this word. <laughs> and he looked round about on them which sat about him, 
and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's quite different than reading in Portuguese. It is very really different. Yes. in English way more. <laughs> It's always a different challenge. Yeah. But it's always a good challenge. So here is the exact question we were talking about. When we say, who is my brother? Who, is, uh, who are my brothers or my brethren? I'll be right in here. He was there talking. There was many people around him. And he, uh, as they see over there, they could not so much as he ran. Basically, they didn't have space to move around. And then they said that his mother and his brethren were waiting for him outside. And he says, who is my mother, who are my brothers? And he says, basically, whosoever shall do the will of God, same as my brother and my sister and my mother. So it doesn't mean that the ones that we have within us, our inner family, are not less important than the other ones. But invite us to see each one of us as equal. Each one. The ones you don't like, the ones you like, the ones you have complex with. Yeah, we're going to spend a little bit of that uh, in the next couple of slides. So here in the gospel according to the scriptism, there's this passage when they uh, when they explain that. Because if you read that, many people would say, Oh, but Jesus don't like his father, don't like his the brothers. And no, you see, never losing an opportunity to teach. He therefore takes advantage of the moment of the arrival of his family in order to clearly show the difference which exists between bodily and the spiritual kinship. Kinship, say, affinity. So, and it is, exists between bodily and spiritual kinship. When we are amongst our group of friends here in the center, we can call each one of us brother and sister. His mom, his mom. But we ever stop it to think about why do you do that? Why do you call them your brother? Why do you call them your sister? Right? Because you share the same spiritual faith, you share the same spiritual kinship, you belong to the same group. We must be made of that. That's why we call each other brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. It's an invitation mm -hmm. because here, basically, what we see is that we belong to the same family. Mm -hmm. I think it's also you feel safe saying that. Safe in the sense that um, sometimes I'm speaking for myself. Sometimes I do have these. You know, especially when you're addressing someone I don't know, or especially if it's through writing. Um, you, I do feel sometimes just, just call brother or sister or as a, to warm up that conversation and to share that feeling that even though I'm not going through your problem, but I, you know, I kind of relate. Um, but not everyone will understand So if you call someone brother or sister. So they yes. always would take as maybe a religious, uh, way yes. and but it, it goes beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. Is the fraternity that's the way that you well, That's true. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, we need to respect everyone's yeah. opinion yeah. in that regard, mm -hmm. right? And we need to be sensible in yeah. the fact mm -hmm. that we understand that they may not mm -hmm. accept the way you say it. Exactly. So basically, there's mm -hmm. other ways. Mm -hmm. So let's move on. So here mm -hmm. we have this very good line with the family. And each one of you here is a part of a family as well. Each one of you belongs to this group, mm -hmm. the whole family. And that's where you share your inner love with mm -hmm. them every day. We have both of you have husbands, and if there were more people, or maybe our friends in the spirit here, mm -hmm. we both have wives during your lifetime. During mm -hmm. the lifetime, we are invited to build mm -hmm. this family. Right? And uh, many times we think about this when we say, Oh, I will do this when I have a family. 
Oh, I'll be happy when I have them. I will just be happy when I mm -hmm. have kids. Yeah. But do you remember, like, when uh, Francisco Xavier Mexico uh, was comforting people that lost someone? What would he say to them? Find your mom mm -hmm. in the other moms in need. Mm -hmm. Find your son, your daughter, mm -hmm. and children in need. Mm -hmm. That's an invitation mm -hmm. to practice the fraternity and see the other mothers, the other fathers, the other brother, the other child can be as important to you as your own children, your relatives. So that's a real invitation for fraternity. And the same goals with each one of us. In different countries and mostly here in Canada, we are invited to practice these kind of fraternity more than anywhere else in the world. Might be other cities that have the same source of uh, internationality, but not as much like in here. I believe that each one of you had the opportunity to interact with people from a multitude of uh, countries, multitude of cultures. And in the end, you can see that you're not different. For me, at least, that was a very interesting opportunity because I can see that I can relate well with people from China, from Africa, from Australia, from other places, from Canada, the United States, places that I've never taught them. Uh, I've seen that in the map, but never imagined that they have the opportunity to meet them. So here, what we have you know, is an opportunity to identify. That each one of those is equal, have the same rights, have the same opportunities, have the same needs, have the same wants. I want these, you want that. Everyone wants the same thing. So, here, there is this beautiful uh, text that we were reading before. It's on the book called The Living Street. It talks about fraternity. The title of this uh, text is called Fraternity. And it says, basically, since the victories of Constantine, remember who was Constantine? Constantine. Constantine. He was the one that said that the official religion of the Romans would be uh, Catholicism. So he was the first one. Before that, Christians would be prosecuted. Persecuted. So that opened the Christian world, the political hegemony. So gave power to the Christianism to have the political force. And we have rehearsed in Seattle uh, several experiences to demonstrate on earth our condition of the disciples of Jesus. So we had the opportunity to provide that, to show that, to really follow Jesus in what we did. But what we have here is we organized renowned councils, formulating conclusions about the nature of God and the soul, the universe, and the life. So basically, they made groups and discussed about these as they knew everything, or like they knew everything, which was not true. We <coughs> and here it comes we supported the devastating wars that implanted misery and terror. And the one that couldn't believe by the timber of our faith. And still today, we lament separation and discord, building branches of incomprehension and animosity, one against the other, in the various sectors of interpretation. So, what we can see here that from that time, we had the opportunity to really prove that we are disciples of Jesus. And still today, we we'll command the separation and discord. That's a very interesting point to think, right? Because it's still something that we can do. We can do this. We are allowed to do anything we have. But we have to deal with the consequences of what we do as well. But when we think about peace, we can see how strong it is 
conflicts that we have. So I don't like people from that culture. I don't like these kind of people. I don't like my colleagues. I don't like these. I don't like that. This is the real movement that we should perform. Like that's what we really should do. It sounds important. Like we raise the point not to say what you should or should not, but to reflect about it. Right? Like you bring that inside and you think about that and then imagine like, have I done this before? Why did I do that? Right? That's some uh, these opportunities that we receive to think about our own bits, our own actions, is very important. Because it's the only way we will perform self-transformation and how we really change inside. Right? So that's very important is to understand why. It's true because oftentimes like you, you say something or you say but you don't necessarily feel that way. And when you have to interact with someone or something happens, all of those real feelings you have inside will come out. Yes. Why? Oh, that must be because this person is from this religion. Oh, that's because of whatever, right? Yes. And as you said, it's important to look inside of us and ask yourself, why? Why does this person bother me? Yes. Is that the person? Is that because it's from such a religion or it's because it's for some country? Or is that because this person has what to do with me? Like what? Yes. It's the person and myself, right? Because you can make all kinds of excuses, but if you don't look inside of you, you're not going to change, mm -hmm. right? That's exactly and it's hard to look inside. Yes. <laughs> it is. Sometimes we may not like what we see, right? Oh, so, that we, we keep hiding because yes. <laughs> we know that we're not going to like it. Well, yes. getting better, but you still have a lot of stuff yes. to work on. Yeah. We are not transforming from one day to the other, no. right? We're putting a break per day in two, three, like we have the opportunity to mm -hmm. only exert it, right? Yeah. But without any anxiety. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not the right way. But that's a very interesting point that you raised uh, when you said that, like, you say something, but then something happens, and then you say something else that comes out. Mm -hmm. When we talk about conscience, when we do the awakening of our conscience, that we decide to do, to do what Jesus said, to understand that our actions, like to see what we do is right and wrong, is when we have our conscience. Right? But when we pretend to do the right, because we believe it's right, we're called feeling inside, and then something like that happens, something happens, and then whatever you were hiding will came, will come out. What that means. That's something called pseudo conscience. That's nasty. That we develop as well. So the pseudo conscience is that oh, I do this because I have to, not because I want to. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about this the other day, and it's like, it's like mm -hmm. let's say chocolate. Mm -hmm. Right? We all like chocolate. Both of us, except <laughs> most of doesn't like chocolate. <laughs> and my sister-in-law, she doesn't yeah. like chocolate. She only feels it. So, uh, using that example, mm -hmm. when we think about chocolate, is I shouldn't eat chocolate because it's wrong, or because I understand that chocolate doesn't do good to me, mm -hmm. or the excess of it, mm -hmm. right? Should I like it's like having that bar over there, but if you just don't go over there because you know that it's wrong, is that the real conscience or the conscience that you understand that you shouldn't do that? Because that's not very good for you at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't mean that we like, right? Yes. What we should do or should not do. It's about having this understanding yes. that the consequences will be could be bad for us or for others, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Because the same many times. Like, is it valid really? to exchange mm -hmm. few moments in our life mm -hmm. for years and years and years of uh, expiation and understanding. Mm -hmm. So let's move on. 
So here we're talking about these uh, rewards that we commented. So about 13,000 year, years ago, they have prehistoric discoveries of wars. They have lances, they have swords, they have darts, uh, they have arrows, they have many things, stones. 7,500 years ago, the Sumerians, or Sumerians, unfortunately, Sumerians is the first civilization that developed an alphabet and had a library. So uh, they had clay books, basically, they had mud, and then they, they made that piece of, of uh, like tablets and they wrote on those. So it would be the first library in the history of humanity, and there were many wars at that point. They were involved in several, several wars. If you think about our neighbor USA and his whole history that is as long as ours, only 21 years of peace. You can imagine a civilization involved in only 21 years of peace. There was the Civil War, there were the war against England, the war against the natives, the war against the uh, French, there was now the war in Iraq. Now there was like 21 years of this. And what they did is returning. You see that these fights have been happening from like 13,000 years ago, more than that before then even. So like, where is the returning here? This is a beautiful picture from a, a, a painter called Gustave Duret. It's an angel leading the crusades. And that was the idea that we had in the past. That's how we call crusades. We have another name for crusades. The Holy War. Oh, yes. Holy War. You don't have anything of holy. We forget. Oh, we yeah. try to forget. Yeah, we try to forget. <laughs> 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 yeah. And it was not in holy in the Holy War. We are using the word of God to foment all these conflicts. I felt so much sorrow for the word until now because those regions are still being uh, fighting for. Like they're still fighting for Iraq, for Afghanistan, from Jerusalem, from Israel. It is started at that point. And we see the opportunity that we have. To raise fraternity, a place where everybody could commune in faith, everybody could join in faith, practicing different beliefs together. It's impossible to visit nowadays because of the risks. You know which state is this? Sorry, what's the question? You know which city is this one? Um. Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem. Yeah. You see, how many civilizations passed through Jerusalem have fought over Jerusalem? Christians, because there was where God was when Jesus was crucified and all that. And then the Muslims, because Muhammad was there and is uh, one of their religious cities as well. And during the crusades, they would tell the people if you go and fight, all your sins will be redeemed. If you kill a Muslim, all your sins will be redeemed. And where is the fraternity there? Right? Like we see that we move it in, in the other way around. Like Jesus said, these are your going to do the other things. How about our brothers of different color? We come from a culture and the racism is still very uh, deep within the roots of the society. Yeah. Which is the difference that we have? Are they less capable? No? Less intelligent? No? Why? Right? Why do you still practice that? Like, when we see, still see that everywhere. So strong. Brazil is another beautiful place where we have the opportunity to embrace different cultures. We have people from all over the world, and you see our backgrounds are different. And I have Portuguese background. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but I don't know which of you background that we have. Italian. 
Italian too. So it would be Italian and African American too. So um, we all have different mixes, like we are part of it. And because we are in different positions in the society, we may believe we're better and worse than people. That's not the right moment. When we talk about uh, something that is very big nowadays, like uh, bullying, like the kids in school, basically, oh, everyone is equal, you are the only one different, and you are worse because you're different. We talk about prejudice for people that have different issues. If you like, is that the real movement? It's just like a big invitation for each one of us to think about this, right? Because we might be, we, or like when, when I was a kid, I believe we did that to other people. Uh, people did that to me, like we all say mm -hmm. that, right? But I think the key word is if you don't know yet, if you don't know better yet, yes. then I mean, it's too wrong, but. When you know that it's not the right movement and you keep doing making yes. excuses. Because exactly. I think nowadays a lot of people say, oh, everything's racism, we can't do this, we can't do that. But maybe we're not practicing racism as much mm -hmm. as before. It still happens, of course. Yes. But then we start um, making other kinds of, uh, how do I say, like differences. To find difference between people, yes. then you divide people through religions, and or no, I don't like this because it's this, or I don't like this because you are Republican, or because you are <laughs> liberal, or because you are left side or right side. Then there is all these kind of things that we do, and it's something that is in us yes. to not be able yet to accept that we are all the same. So if someone says racism is wrong, then we. We kind of know that it's wrong, and then we try not to do it, but then we do these separations between people or yes. difference differentiation us to other people in other things. It yeah. sounds like we, we don't know to accept that we yes, are the uh, same. It's kind of the, yeah. the, the chocolate idea again. Yeah. Because, like, I can eat chocolate, mm -hmm. but how about candy? How about exactly. cotton candy? Mm -hmm. How about the other? So I can eat chocolate now. I never not mm -hmm. eat because they say it's bad. Yeah. But then I eat chocolate, I eat cotton candy, mm -hmm. and candy with sugar, whatever, mm -hmm. because of what? And because nobody said it's wrong. And then they won't say that's probably as well. Then they move to the other one. Yes. The other one. Like, why do we follow the law? Because there will be consequences. Sure, but uh, I mean, like, if there were no consequences, would you still follow the law or not? We should follow the law because it's the right thing to do, not oh, because yes, we shouldn't yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. like, why shouldn't I steal? Why shouldn't I like, mm -hmm. go to the gas station and kill, like, yeah. kill my car and then run away? Like, <laughs> because it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. Not because there will be consequences. Like, it will be mm -hmm. like, again, the mosaic law. Yeah. I remember when we talked about the mosaic law from Moses. Mm -hmm. That uh, will be, you do this, there will be a consequence. You do this, there will be a consequence. But later on, with Jesus, we could understand that we're free to do whatever we want to do, but we don't need to deal with the consequences of what we do as well. So we have the opportunity to understand that the law was not white and black, black and white. So there's many other frames to that. So here, we'll discuss a very interesting passage from. Uh, as we believe in a song of Francisco de Assis, the sublime prayer of Francis of Assisi. And talks about fraternity as well. So if I recognize that I am a divine creature, I recognize that my neighbor also is. And therefore, him and I do be united with well, an essential and profound aspect. So I'll be united with him in a profound and essential aspect. However, I don't necessarily need to agree with my neighbor in everything he believes. The responsibility to work to be able to love and practice the law of love, justice, and charity belong to each one of us. So, if I reflect about my life, why is it important? 
Why is it important to have these existence? Why do I believe in God? Why God is so important in my life? If you think about these, and you identify yourself as a divine creature, and you say, so I am divine, I have God's essence within me, but am I exclusive? Or each one of us also have the same essence within me. This movement of seeing in your brother the same essence that you have inside removes the roots of prejudice and disrespect that you have within, uh, within yourself because you can understand that you are equal. You might be in different stages of development, but you do have the same thing. I recognize that my neighbor also is, and therefore, him and I will be united. In the central looking aspect, so yes, because we are divine essence. But again, I don't need to agree with him in everything he thinks. I need to respect him. And again, here talks about our own need, responsibility, work to be able to love and practice the law of justice, uh, love, justice, and charity. It's for each one of us. So he is not respecting. I don't need to agree with that. What I need to understand is that he is the divine essence. He doesn't deserve to die. He doesn't deserve to be punished. You need to understand that this law is important. And he needs to deal with the consequences of what he did. But he needs to understand that he is human. He is the divine essence. So when we see what happens, somebody, everybody, everyone does mistakes in their own lives. Many times, every day. Last year, or worse than six. But we need to be judged and tortured. And we need to be accused of these, accused of that every day. That's not the moment. Let's move on. If my neighbor is in accordance, that is not in accordance, I shouldn't agree with his ideas. Although we are seeing it as divine essence on my side, I should continue to love and respect the law of freedom that allows the one to not comply with the major law. Being himself the responsible for this, for this time in mind, I will be united with my neighbors in a loving way. I'll only ask different ideas because that's exactly the same thing I would like to be done to me. So, if we don't accord in our ideas, doesn't mean that I have to embrace his ideas or say he is wrong or he's right. I should continue to respect and love the law of freedom. So when we try to control other people, we're not respecting the law of freedom. Right? When we say that our way is the best way, we don't respect the law of freedom. Because we don't understand that they have the opportunity to do that. Right? But what is our responsibility? Here it says that allows you one to not comply with the major laws. So, so if somebody is doing something that is wrong, that's against the major law, they have the freedom to do so. But we shouldn't do this. We should move in the other direction, as we had in this other slide here. We need to work to be able to love and practice the law of love, justice, and charity by ourselves. Yeah, just um, Please, huh? something. So that doesn't mean that if we see someone doing something wrong, yeah. that will, of course, cause bad consequences to others. If we can prevent that to happen, yes. then it's different. But if there's something we can do, because that's affecting other people, then yes. we actually should try yeah. to do something yes. about we'll it. We're talking about, yeah, more about so, ideas. Okay. <laughs> We're talking about the actions. Yeah. Right? Exactly. We will never comply with any action. Yeah. That would harm to any other people or to the people mm -hmm. themselves, right? Mm -hmm. But we're talking just about mostly about yeah. beliefs, yes. right? Yes, exactly. But that's a great point. Thank you, mm -hmm. So when they have different religions, here comes fraternity again. Why one belief is better than the other beliefs? 
to like why his belief should be stronger than Muhammad? Why did he should throw stones at people that don't believe in the same religion? If uh, I remember, like in Brazil last year or two years ago, there were some religions that even like the African religions and they would hunt those people and throw stones at them because they didn't agree and they would play with the devil, whatever they were saying. So, like, is that really, apparently, are they really uh, believing what they're hearing? The listening in church, do they understand what they believe in? Do we understand what we believe in? Mm -hmm. So the question again, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And they say, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. And there is the section of the gospel according to the spiritism talking about the good spirits. So, uh, somebody would like to read? It's just curious to the one who truly understood and above all one deeply and sincerely felt fit to the results already spoken, which uh, characterize uh, the true spirit just as much as the true Christian. For them, they are one and the same. Experience does not institute any new morals. It only makes it easier for mankind to understand and practice Christian's morals by giving an unshakable and enlightened faith to those who are in the home or who were. Yes. When are we understood? So when we really understand what we're talking about, do we believe? Really what we believe, do you do? Do you understand? It's here. Uh, when we totally understood a formal, when weakness and silly felt, when we really feel that, it's the result already expounded. And you characterize the true spirit that's that in nature is the same nature as the true Christian. So we don't institute any new morals, but it makes it easier for us to understand we have a better explanation. And we'll give an important faith and shake on an enlightened faith. The ones that are not the new able. Many times we were the ultra, we were the ones. In this lifetime, in our lifetimes, when we say, oh, before I became the spirit that spoke before. Or I understood the spiritism, I would be in doubt and I would be waving it. So here we have I am Walter Spirit, the tribal, I or myself in Walter Spirit, the divine loss, and God. This as the triangle that we keep in mind when we talk about fraternity, we talk about the other laws, we talk about the other virtues. That's my bad, I shouldn't have translated these as well. But we, as immortal spirits, are invited to develop the essential virtues to accomplish, to, to fall the divine laws, and to manifest within ourselves the attributes of God. And then these virtues are seen, each one of them, that need the proper care. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Are we finishing by phone? You think? The, the kids? Yes. The kids? Yes. No, they're not finished. No, they're finishing by phone. Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, virtues are like seeds. When you talk about developing the seeds inside each one of us, and there are several books from the speeches that when we see that we deal with different problems in our life, some people may face anxiety. Some people may face depression. Some people may face um, lack of uh, self-respect in several regards. And they say sometimes we mistreat us so badly that the soil inside us is very dry. We need to exert the irrigation of that soil very often. So when somebody has this issue and there's like in one of the books an invitation to say, no, like, you are a good person, you deserve these. Like, when we believe that you're not uh, 
you don't deserve anything. You know you deserve these because you these you deserve it. You are in mortal spirit. You have the right to have the opportunity to prove yourself. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> so you have the opportunity to do that. And he says that each one of those moments is like a drop of water in this very dry soil. And many people gave up on the idea well, because they say, oh, it didn't do anything to me. But they thought that for one or two points. So if you have a real dry soil inside yourself, and you put a drop of water it doesn't make any difference. But if you do keep you know, exercise, exerting that, basically they will grow. You prepare the soil for the growth of the seed. And you think that the virtues are like seeds, each one of them. We need to prepare the right soil for them to plant so they have the opportunity to grow inside us. And my plant lifetime from opportunity to opportunity. In care. In care. In care. In care. Exactly. Not just it's not that they will grow. Now I'm gone. Keep on exerting each one of them. That's the biggest invitation. So that's the uh, final uh, portion of the same text we started from the living spring. Let's see, let us spread, therefore, the pure and simple fraternity exerting mutual support. Fraternity that works and helps, comprehends and forgives between humility and the service that secure the victory of the good. Let us attend to it. Wherever we may be, remembering the words of the Lord that said with clarity and pledge. By the show of men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one another. And we are invited to think about this again. When we exert the love for one another. We love the ones that we like and don't love the ones that we dislike. We understand that they are divine essence as well, that they have the same rights, the same opportunities that we receive. That God loves us, love them as much as He loves us. Because if God loves everyone in the same way, and we understand that God is perfection, what He does. Is it right? So why are we going against the rebellion against God, loving people in different ways? So we need to keep caring about those seeds inside our hearts. Each one of them. And here we have this image from the cross. Because from this book, more and often, that's basically uh, a book from Francisco Xavier. He cyprus book, and the writer will be in that to become the spiritual writer. And we'll get many passages from the life of Jesus that are stored in the other side, specifically. So here, each moment is when he's being crucified. So at that point, while they talk, that Mary was seen there. Wonderful. And should be remembering days when he was a kid. So she remembered all the experiences she had with him as a boy when he would bring home, as a kid, when he would bring home people that needed help. He would bring peace, he would bring people that were suffering, he would bring these, he would bring those. He would, uh, there was a description in the book saying that. How many times she found him in the streets talking to these people, giving them a good, a good word as a kid. And she remembers the day when he was born. And she remembers the beautiful music of nature that were playing in that moment. She remembers him growing up. And she remembers him. In Nazareth or in all the other places, you get some money, or when he was preaching in the lake. So she would remember to see this beautiful nature around the people gathering to listen to him. She would be crying very much because she was his mother. 
He was his mom. And uh, it's very good, it was very touching that moment. Like when she was crying, somebody comes and takes her by the shoulder. And that strong moment. And uh, Jesus were there and they cross and they were in front of him. And they both, both look at him. And then he said, Woman, behold your son. And then he said, The disciple, John, behold your mother. So that's in the last moment, last words he said, Behold your son, hold your mother. When we talk about who is my mother, who are my brothers, here he says that. And more than that, when we talk about peace, Behold your mother, John. Get implicit to John that John should care about Mary. So Mary moved away after Jesus died. And each one of the disciples went to different places to preach. But later on, John came back and with Mary. They had a small house around the, around the sea. And there, they were receiving the people that would come. Um, I'm looking for help. The fact that the mother of Jesus were amongst them provided lit the fire and the belief of the people that would go there and call her a mother. So, when he said, when he said to John, Behold your mother, he says to each one of us, he gave in the figure of Mary, the mother mother, to the whole new world. So everybody could go there and seek for her help on the mother himself. So she became the mother of many, many people, of each one of us that find in Mary this loving uh, love of the mother. When we discuss the other book called uh, Memoirs of the Suicide. The name of the people that helps this suicide, friends that are in the most rebellious state of mind, it's called Legion of Servants of Mary. So she coordinates all the help and support they receive with her eternal love. It is amazing. And later on, when she was old, somebody comes. A very our mother, and they say thank you to her and all that. And he explains about the sky, he explains about the life. And she taught, This is the first one that comes to view. All the other ones came to take somebody or to receive. And then he extends the hands to her, and she could see the marks in his hands and the marks in his feet. And she said, Oh. And he said, yes, mom, I came back to, to, to bring you back to be a queen of the angels. So that's the moment that she passed the cross. It is good. Sorry. No problem. It is good we need. So any comments? Bernie? We can see what that. We're ready as well. Let me see. You can do all final prayer as well. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes. You can do it. Yes, that's what I was going to say. But that's a very beautiful story, isn't it? Yeah. I just got a picture of it. Can you imagine how beautiful would that be? 
and the same be some of those strong for that. Well, of course, yeah. Wouldn't it be selected by the state? Oh, no. To have that. <laughs> yeah. Right? In, in the book, The Memory of Suicide, as well, there is a feature in the spiritual side that is a kid. He's not a kid, but of course, but the spirits are not kids or yeah. adults, right? Mm -hmm. But he decided to keep his image as a kid because that was the exact time he saw Jesus preach. Oh. And he was one of those kids when he said, like, come to be children. So he was one of those children. And he said, at that moment, that was like so strong in his own mind that he decided that he is appearing to me mm -hmm. as the same children, as the same child. Yeah. Yeah. We put on some music and we are finding prayer. Jesus, our blood and guide. Talk about the beautiful love of Mary that is a honor for each one of us. We hope, Father, to improve the opportunities that we have each and every day that we may see each other the divine essence, the brother and the sister, the mother and the father. One day, our hearts will beat with the same calmness. In that day, the love. Thank you. Thank you all. So we mean that. Amen. We have uh, something to show to us today. Oh, oh yes, yes. I keep Okay, so what we did today was uh, we drew a thermometer because uh, um, we wanted to, we want, we listed emotions or feelings. Uh, first, we did happy, then uh, sad, upset, and mad. And then we drew the thermometer to represent each one. And uh, we listed some common things with, with the, the, the original words. And then basically, um, here we we did we wrote what we could do to prevent uh, these feelings. Uh, so yeah. And then like what is gonna give us a few examples of the things we can do. Um when you're happy what you can do is play, draw, play. <coughs> when you're sad you can have some alone time, you can dance, eat, read. When you're upset, you can breathe, buy fried, coloring. When you're mad, you can <coughs> walk away, go to a quiet place, pray, count, and talk to someone who can help you. 